If we're getting into discussing characters in Dawn Trail, we had to go here sooner or later. Out of everyone introduced in Dawn Trail, everyone that returned for Dawn Trail, there's someone standing head and shoulders above the rest in terms of audience appeal. Well, head and other head and shoulders above everyone else in audience appeal. And also literally. Look, we're talking about the cool Jar Jar today, that's the point. But the question I wanted to answer isn't one that's necessarily within the game, it's within the fanbase. How did this guy, out of all the guys, ring so true as to become THE guy for Dawn Trail? How does his story specifically, how does his character specifically, speak so loudly to everyone? Today, I'm going to try to figure that out. Quick spoiler warning for Dawn Trail, and opinion warning, because I have them. If you like this, do all the YouTube things with likes, subscribes, comments, and all that. And now, let's talk about everyone's favourite, and possibly also second favourite, Lizard in Dawn Trail. I was going back and forth on if I should approach this chronologically by the game's story or by his life, but I think the actual sequence the game goes through is important, so we're mostly going to be going by that order. But Bakul's history is actually only barely more detailed than Zorolja's. He was born to Zorilja and Milalja, with Zoril being the current Autarch of Mamuk. It's not clear if he was at the time of Bakul's birth. A time that, incidentally, we don't know. We have no idea how old Bakul Jaja actually is, and we don't even have context clues like with Zorolja. He could be the oldest or youngest claimant and we wouldn't know. Although personally, I read him as the youngest. Rather famously, blessed siblings are both extremely rare and extremely treasured by traditional Mamulja society, with their combination of the Hubigo's physical strength and the Bunawa's magical ability making them essentially the best Mamulja can produce. And so they very typically find themselves given positions of leadership and respect. This is also true of Bakul, he's leading his own mercenary group that helps him throughout the right. Speaking of the right, if Zorolja was the safe bet and the crowd favourite, Bakul is the wild card. The only participant in the right that is not from Galul Jar Jar's royal family, Bakul won his place in a tournament held in Mamuk. Each participant in the right does sort of represent and espouse an aspect of Galul that people think is important to his reign. And Bakul's is very literal, that Galul Jar Jar is a blessed sibling and that for reasons of both expertise and Mamulja status, the next Dawn Servant should be too. To that end, he's the one that's not even putting forth policy or ideals. He doesn't think he has to win over a single person, and that he shouldn't even need to prove himself at all, so his approach is just full-on wrestling heel. He can't win over the crowd, so instead he's going to make an enemy of all of them. Into the ride itself, Bakul has one game plan. To cheat. We don't see every way that Bakul clears a right, but every single attempt we do see revolves around stealing from another claimant. What's interesting is that he does this in a surprisingly smart way. The feat of reads, he waits until he sees a solution that can be effectively stolen, and then takes that. He throws us off in Ihu Ikaramu by hitting the actual weak point of our approach, which is the reins on the Punati. The feat of pots? Okay, that one goes poorly at first, he underestimated Zorolja really hard. But his second attempt is actually pretty clever, to steal the reward of the challenge rather than the objective. And to do so by exploiting Wook Lamarth's relative lack of personal strength. He's not breaking the rules out of brute force, he's doing it cleverly, wielding his power to break exactly the right windows. This even goes through to his biggest breach unleashing Balagadamanda, which he can basically only do because he figures out exactly the weak point to aim at. He is doing horrible things, but he's doing it in a way that nobody else could. Like with Zorolja, well, like with every claimant, things turn when he's faced with the feat of repast. But with Bakul, it's not really the feat that matters. We learn basically right out the gate that he plans to cheat again. And when he does, it's in a different method. He knows he can't blindside Wuklamat again, so he doesn't try, and instead he plays on an emotional connection that he just sort of assumes is there with Hunmu Ruk. 
that doesn't work out so great, you can't really exploit an emotional connection that isn't actually there, and Wuklamart doesn't know that he is her biological dad. His plan is to force Wuklamart into a one-on-one, -on -one, which should work by all evidence. But Bakul doesn't realize that she is a shonen anime protagonist who's powered by resolve and friendship, so she beats him there, and this just wrecks him. But probably not because of losing per se, but losing here, right before the claimant challenge in Mamuk. Now, he has to face his dad and show that he's doing pretty bad. And in being witness to that confrontation, we learn that Bakul's dad is very invested in his son winning the right and that he's the source of Bakul's outlook on cheating. He wants his son on that throne at all cost, and he incidentally thinks that cost is what Clamart's to pay, and doesn't take well to the fact that this did not work out the last time his son did it. zaril has got a plan B going. He's more focused on Mamulja getting power in Toral at all, than his son being the one to claim it. But that's not necessarily important to us right now, because in the following scenes, Every single fact behind Bakul is laid out right in front of us. First of all, while it's true that blessed siblings are sent out into the world as leaders, they rarely come back. All of their power and wisdom is amounting to naught in leadership positions, as they just keep failing in them. One of those is our fault. And in fact, Malor Jarjar's general incompetence might suggest that the blessed siblings maybe aren't all they're cracked up to be. On top of that, it turns out the Blessed Siblings aren't rare per se. They're rare to have survive infancy. Blessed Sibling infant mortality rates are so high, they've got an entire burial ground devoted solely to them. And yet, Mamuk's so plagued by issues rooted in their homeland that feel fundamentally unfixable that anyone who hasn't moved away is absolutely fixated on blessed siblings as the only way to get any better solution. Or are a member of a much smaller crowd that realizes that all this madness has to end. That second crowd includes Malalja, Bakul's mother, so suddenly Bakul's entire emotional backdrop is clear. He was born into one hell of a pit of expectations. Plagued with the knowledge of how many dead, blessed children there are, that the survivors are failing en masse, that his father's leading a hometown relying on him to succeed, and that his mother is part of a movement knowing that this is all horribly wrong, he's put into one hell of an emotional hard place. Everything is riding on him to succeed, so he has to do it at all costs, just so that this madness might finally stop. Almost all of his actions before now suddenly make complete sense. His rampant cheating has been out of pure desperation. He couldn't play fair because playing fair might mean he loses. He's gone full heel because, fuck, Tulialal hasn't helped them before, even if he doesn't really understand why. The only thing that doesn't add up is him releasing Valagarmanta, but I've seen a suggestion that it might be just pure nihilistic lashing out. An interesting wrinkle in how this story unfolds from here is that the response to him pouring all of this out in front of the Warrior of Light, Wuklamart, and the rest isn't absolution. 14's usually a very forgiving game, but this time, the stance is that having a good excuse isn't enough. He has to do better, and to his credit, he immediately steps up on that. He backs up Wuklamart and Kona as they actually try to understand Mamuk's underlying problems with his presence facilitating both learning the plight and hearing the solution. And while after this point, Bakul gets relatively little screen time, just because Dawn Trail's story starts focusing on places that he isn't, he does keep this up. He's seen defending Tulilal in both of the Alexandria attacks, and is the real voice of the crowd in support of the new Dawn servants as they announce their response to that first attack. His big wrestling heel persona turns face, he rallies the crowd. He's seen really liking the positive reinforcement he gets from the Landsguard for once during the second attack, which probably leads to where we find him as the credits roll, having joined the Landsguard himself, being present for the Skydeep Cenote being entrusted to them. Redemption is a journey for him, but it's one that he's happy to make. And if I'm going to take some guesses, I think he'll be a hardy focus of Dauntrow's patches. That makes two of us. Uh, or was that two of we? Ah, uh, never mind that. 
So first of all, there's an element that I want to bring up that I think helped Bakul Jar Jar, but wasn't actually the reason that he became so popular. That right out the gate, liking Bakul became a meme. For people who weren't there, forgot, or just didn't really care, right on Dawn Trial's release, the player base tried to hold to the same community spoiler embargo that it always does. But that's hard. People want to talk about the new expansion, but they don't want to spoil anything. You gotta find some kind of outlet. And in this case, a way people handled that was by getting really horny over Bakul Jar Jar. Personally, I didn't like that meme. That is largely my asexuality talking. Uh, sex jokes aren't that fun for me. They feel fundamentally demeaning, and I really wish we'd stop reaching for that as the first gag off the rack. I don't know if we as a community are funny enough to do better than this, but we could at least try doing something different than this once in a while. But that's not really the point I'm making. I think that the reason that meme happened was because he is uniquely well positioned. He's an early character, he's visually striking, he's very charismatic, first as a good villain, then as a sympathetic character. Joking about anyone else would get too close to spoilers, but joking about Bakul Jar Jar being sexy, funnel all your love into that act, you're gonna be fine. But there's something interesting about that meme. It's still alive. Usually memes that crop up around or before a game's release die out fairly quickly, because they're just crushed by the sheer weight of the actual game. The ones that survive that period are usually the ones that end up having some kind of truth. Glaive Master Houdia was a memed fake Elden Ring character who died the moment we got actual Elden Ring gameplay because he didn't matter anymore. In contrast, the jokes about Jack from Stranger of Paradise being an asshole that's singularly focused on killing chaos, those survived because, well, that is actually Jack's character in that game. So the meme probably shaped how people express liking Bakul, but I don't think that it would still be here if people didn't genuinely like him this much. So we've still got an open question here. I could go on about how his story is well written, how he's well performed, even well animated. I could say that his entire appeal comes from just raw quality, and I'm sure all of his fans would like to hear that, but here's the thing. Dawn Trail is a quality expansion, even if you disagree with me about that, in a quality game. If we were only ever responding to quality, Bakul would be sharing his podium with a very diverse crowd. Since he's not, we cannot merely account for quality. We have to account for taste. And over the 11 years that it's been the contiguous thing that it is now, 14's player base has shown that it has very specific tastes. If you want 14's player base to like a character, you don't just have to guess how to make one. There are things that the player base at large bites on, character archetypes we go nuts for, and 14's writers know it. That's not to say 14 has become a lineup of cliches and crowd pleasers. Dawn Trail alone has characters like Wook Lamart, where they dust off less liked character archetypes for another run, and characters like Sphine that don't cleanly fit any pre existing molds. But there are those reliable standards that parts of the player base will reliably respond to in the right way. You give us a friendly, loyal, pretty man with faint romantic subtext, the player base will applaud them and embrace them. You give us a boisterous, loud fellow who goes through hard times, probably one of the larger races, we'll like him really quick. There's archetypes fit for purpose too. Raid storylines are fantastic for generally friendly people of a mysterious role who's clearly keeping a secret. We love those characters. Woman who's a tragic victim of circumstance lashing out at the world rather than the actual cause of her pain? Perfect material for a supporting villain. And pretty solid fuel for an anti-hero too. Once you know your audience as well as 14's writers do, it's pretty easy to play to them. And Bakul Jar Jar is playing to them. Strip away the specifics of his story, and he's a pretty recognisable series of character traits. He's Emmett Selk and Xenos combined. He's got Emmett's deep-seated tragic backstory rooted in a societal loss and a misguided need to fight for the dead, as well as a generally bitchy nature. 
combined with Xenos' more directly confrontational style and terrible relationship with his dad and, by extension, the society that he is part of. Emmett and Xenos definitely have two different sort of character appeals, even if they're both villains. And Bakul just takes the bits and pieces of both that their respective fans most love. Well, except for the part where he's not conventionally attractive. I'd argue that Bakul's biggest new inclusion to that formula is actually explicit remorse. Emmett fans especially have tried to convince me that he felt remorse for his actions as an Asian, and I've seen the same case made for Xenos, but it's not actually an explicit part of the text in either case. Or, at best, it's a very quiet one. Meanwhile, that is the sole intention of Bakul's biggest scene. That particular change also leads to what I think is the biggest difference, but it's not about how they write Bakul, per se. It's how they write everything around him. He is not immediately granted redemption or vindication. The reflexive kindness that the game gives Emmett and Xenos, especially in death, just isn't quite extended to Bakul in the same way at any point. I suspect part of this might be a Daichi Hero thing. You saw similar things with other characters he wrote. But another element might just be the fact that his big emotional scene happens in the middle of the story. Someone once brought up a comparison to me that I think is pretty apt. Darth Vader's crimes are never brought up after his death because there's just not enough movie left to focus on it. And the credits similarly roll at Emmett and Xenos' death even if the game keeps going afterwards. So we're basically just left to take the game's word for it. Meanwhile, Bakul's emotional turn is just a little bit before the halfway point and Bakul's alive afterwards, so we aren't in that time strap position. He's got the room to show he can do better, rather than the game just telling us that he's earned it. At the time, I was maybe saying that a bit antagonistically myself. Bakul is challenging if people actually like the package that they said they like of a sympathetic and tragic victim with a redemption arc standing as the antagonist. Or if they just like being able to side with a pretty villain and claim that they're on some level morally right for it. Obviously, the answer to that wound up being a resounding yes. But maybe that wasn't as much of a challenge as I first thought. Maybe the writers knew that it was the right move. When I decided I was doing Zerol and Bakul videos back to back, I considered doing a video on every single claimant. And the reason that I'm not doing that is actually because I don't have much to say about Kona. Which is interesting because even before we got the expansion, I was predicting he'd be the runaway favourite. But in thinking about it, maybe both my assumed favouritism of him and the fact that I don't have much to say might be because of the same reason. Like Bakul, Kona is a tried and true archetype. But unlike Bakul, Kona plays his archetype completely straight. I described the friendly, loyal, pretty man that everyone goes nuts for earlier. There's a few ways that manifests, but Kona in particular is borrowing so much from Graha and Erinville's general styles that Graha and Kona just straight up have the same face with the only difference being skin and eye colour and Kona's tragic case of resting bitch face. And maybe that's the reason that he isn't the favourite I thought he'd be. Yes, this sort of character works well, but we've already got a Graha Tia. Just giving us a lime flavoured version doesn't catch a lot of people who weren't already being catered to pretty well. We've already got an Erinville, we don't need one with shorter ears. And that goes especially true when they aren't even in another expansion. Graha and Erinville are prominent characters in the exact same story that Kona's in. For Erinville, they're frequently sharing the same scenes. The people who really bite on that sort of character, they've already got what they want, and they're already attached to the character they like. Sure, there's an element of hell yeah two cakes. I can't imagine those players are mad, and yes, Kona's got a fair share of his own fans, but for the most part, I don't think you can really get the same impact by just giving us more of the same. Bakul's greatest strength isn't in being a new Emmet or a new Xenos. It's in being almost a new Emmet or a new Xenos. 
Enough similarities to get the appeal that we know works. Enough new stuff to not just be a remix. Once a formula is confirmed to work, the most important thing to do with it is to not just stick to it. I don't think that's a rule specific to characters either. I genuinely think Orogenics is a better dungeon than Vanguard, but they hit so many of the same notes that I just don't actually care that much about Orogenics. It's not giving me anything that Vanguard didn't, even if it gave those things better. In Watchu Makey Makey's quests, I wasn't alone in being disappointed that the Alchemist and Culinarian questline treads the exact same ground as the Facet and Studium questlines did. The worst thing that developers can do is just play the hits. It gets old sooner or later. And eventually, when I keep extending this thought, I end up weirdly close to where we started. At Shadowbringers. Ever since Endwalker, especially since Dawn Trail, I have seen people beg for a return to the quality of Shadowbringers, with that definition of quality ranging from its perceived darkness in tone to whatever role they think Natsuko Ishikawa had then but not now, to even literal plot threads like going to other shards or bringing back Emmett Selk. I think a lot of these people don't actually understand why they like Shadowbringers, but they recognize that they do like Shadowbringers and they want another one. And I think that the worst thing that 14 could ever do is produce just a Shadowbringers 2. And I think the developers know that, because Dawn Trail, in a funny way, feels like a specific effort not to do it. Yes, it brings in another shard, but it does so in a way that specifically averts a lot of the things that Shadowbringers did with that medium. And the specific refusal to even name what shard it was involved until later interviews, and to not give Astian involvement even a cursory mention, feels very deliberate. That's them saying that they know what worked, but we're not going to recreate its totemic hooks. The Unlost World works in the same way Bakul Jar Jar does, by recognizing those internal core elements that actually worked for people, and then giving them an entirely new everything else. And I think the fact that they went for this and that they succeeded shows far more success than just making Emmett Selk 2. So there we have it. My read, Bakul Jar Jar is popular because he is exactly the 14 fanbase's type, but with a zesty new twist. I think this one might be controversial because I didn't just default to an appeal to quality but I think it's better if we accept that there was intent behind it. It wasn't just coincidence. If you disagree with me, get in the comments about it. If you liked all this, we've got a Discord server in the description that's been a real nice place to hang out, and I've got a coffee if you're inclined to throw me some money. I'm not sure if I'll shout out everyone who ever donates. I'm interested in hearing how people feel about those sorts of reels, but I did want to shout out the first people who did so. Draco, MCG Mark, and The Narai. I want to thank every single one of you for watching, and I hope to see you all again real soon.